Okay, let's get started. Uh, now we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to talk about cache management. We're going to reuse it, the caches, as you know. Uh, we started with caches almost. Uh, and now we're going to get back to the caches. We'll see. Uh, there's a lot of work in this area. I'm not going to be able to cover all, but I'll give you some interesting ideas, hopefully. But before we start, let's take a step back. This is what we've done in the last two and a half lectures, I think. Uh, memory interference and quality of service. And we've covered a lot of techniques, actually. So hopefully these are fascinating and interesting. Uh, and these are real. Uh, today, uh, well, right now, we're going to talk about shared cache management. And if we have time, we're going to move to making caching more effective. But I don't think we'll have time for this. We'll see if we will cover it in the next uh, time. So making caching more effective, meaning because caches are a much more uh, uh, precious resource, when you have many, many threads that are sharing them, how do you make caching more effective? Meaning get, the, get more out of your cache. You don't want to waste your cache with useless stuff. But if you actually look at systems today, most of the stuff that gets into the caches are useless. They're not used again. There's a lot, there are a lot of studies that show that in the L2 cache, about 70% of the cache blocks are dead. Dead meaning that they're not going to be touched before they uh, get evicted. That's a lot. So you have this huge cache and most of the uh, cache is useless. So how do you make it more effective is one thing. And also there's another approach. Uh, so you can make it more effective by being more intelligent about what to bring into the cache, what to keep into the cache, what to evict. Ideally, you would like to bring the stuff that you need right when you need it and then evict it right after you're done with it, right? But we don't do that today. And the second one is you can actually uh, uh, make your small cache appear as a big cache by doing compression, for example. Because if your data is duplicated a lot in your cache, which is also shown in many works, how do you actually make your small cache more compressed and as a result appear like a bigger cache? So let's see if we get to it. I'm not sure if we will. But we'll talk about shared cache management. But before that, let's take a broader view. We're already actually, I think, two thirds of the course. Is that true? Yeah. We basically covered 17.5 lectures. And we're in the middle of 18 right now. Uh, all cutting edge yet fundamental topics. Hopefully you'll like it. Uh, all research areas are all ongoing. Three labs, three homeworks. Now you're doing the fourth ones, right? Okay, good. And many readings, hopefully. Uh, so uh, I just want to get a, a point check. So if you have any feedback, please email me directly. Uh, this is a small course, which is good. Uh, only the interested people take it. <laughs> I like that also. Uh, but let me know if there's any feedback, especially if we want to improve the labs into the future. Your feedback is very, very important, right? Because labs sometimes, we have actually a lot of choice in the labs. And uh, it'd be good to get feedback on the labs, like what, uh, what you liked, what you didn't like, uh, what is hard, what is easy, what can be made easier. Uh, because in the next iteration of the course, well, you won't benefit from your own feedback, unfortunately. <laughs> but somebody else in the future will, uh, which is how it works in general in life. Uh, uh, yeah, so basically any type of feedback about the course, but especially labs uh, and suggestions for better learning on your part, uh, please be, uh, maybe you can, you can say anything, that's fine. Uh, any ideas you might have, any, any related topic is also fine actually. So for example, if you think uh, we covered something for too long, uh, that's also good to say. It may not change easily, but <laughs> at least it's good to know. And also, if you want to do research in any of the covered topics or any topic in computer architecture, hardware, software interaction, and related areas, please feel free to contact me. There are many, many projects uh, and ideas and open, uh, open uh, exploration, a great environment to perform top-notch research. Certainly, uh, bachelor's, master's, semester projects, and other things as well. And internships, too. Okay, so basically, talk with me, email in person. I guess you don't have my number with WhatsApp. Did I provide it? Maybe, maybe it's in one of these earlier slides. But okay, you can find me here, so that's easy <laughs> uh, to get that also. Okay, now that I've said that, please uh, try to do this. You can do it any time, of course. You can do it after the course also, right? If something comes to your mind two years after you take this course, that's fine. <laughs> Feel free to email me. Uh, but the earlier, the better. Okay, so now let's jump into multi-core caching issues. There are many, many issues over here. Uh, 
Now, clearly, multi-core, meaning multiple threads, put more pressure on the cache hierarchy and the memory hierarchy. Cache efficiency becomes a lot more important. And there are issues like this, private versus shared caching. Should the cache be private to the core? Should the cache be shared across multiple different cores? In a simultaneous multi-threaded engine, it's actually shared between multiple cores. So it's already shared if you have simultaneous multi-threading. That's one topic, for example, that I, unfortunately I cannot fit into this course schedule. Uh, I could cover simultaneous multi-threading, but we don't really have time. It's a fascinating area. I could cover data flow also in more detail, but we don't have time uh, in the schedule somehow. Uh, okay, uh, but with multi-threading, clearly you have, uh, a cho uh, you have shared caches, but in multi-core, is the cache private to the core versus shared? We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Providing fairness and quality of service, clearly that's a problem. How do you handle shared data between the cores? Uh, if the cores are sharing data, just like we've discussed in multi-threaded applications. How do you organize or connect the caches? We've seen one example where you distribute the cache uh, across uh, a, a grid, like earlier, right? This is called non-uniform cache access. Basically, uh, the cache, you're, you're closer to the cache bank that is closest to you, basically. And ideally, you would like to map the data that you hit most on to the cache bank that's closest to you. But you also have data that's far away, uh, and you, you have this huge cache space uh, that's distributed across the chip, right? If you have a distributed on chip uh, context. So, how do you handle that non uniform caches management becomes important? How do you actually design the interconnect for that cache is important. We don't have time to go into a lot of the details of this, but it's, it's fascinating. It resembles pretty much a distributed system, but you do it on a chip. So you have a lot more power constraints. Uh, you have some flexibility, of course, because in a real distributed system, you don't have, uh, it, it, it's not imaginable to have centralized control easily, except for tasks that don't require a lot of communication. Whereas on chip, you can actually have much better centralized control. So that's the big advantage of having a distributed system on chip. You get scalability, but you can also get the benefits of centralized control, potentially. And we will talk about that when we talk about interconnects. So uh, there's also placement and insertion issues, identifying what is most profitable to insert into the cache, minimizing dead or useless blocks. So that's important. And there's replacement, uh, which block is the most profitable to keep. This becomes in, in, even, even more interesting with multi-core. We talked about MLP aware cache replacement, for example, earlier in the course, cost aware cache replacement. Uh, how do you define cost when you have multiple cores? No, it becomes interesting, right? What is the uh, importance of a cache block. So one issue is cache coherence. I'll go through this relatively quickly. Uh, the basic question, uh, actually, if you have time, we'll cover the cache coherence uh, in more detail. But the basic question is if multiple processors share the cache, uh, uh, cache the same block, how do they ensure they all see a consistent state? Assume that the caches are private. So this is a cache, this is a cache, they're private to each core. Uh, and uh, this processor over here loads uh, one location, a thousand over here. This processor also loads uh, location X. They both get a thousand, which is good. It, everything is consistent over here. Uh, now this processor stores, decides to store 2000 to X. Now what happens to these uh, values over here? Clearly this processor should not get uh, 1000 at this point, right? Because it's a stale value. It happens to be cached. So caches cause these problems clearly, and you know about the cache coherence problem, and we'll talk about the solutions to this. So there could be software-based solutions and hardware-based solutions. Uh, I'll go through these very quickly, but, but basically, if the caches are invisible to the software, then you cannot ensure coherence somehow. You need to have some ways of uh, providing support in the ISA, and I'm not gonna cover this slide. We'll talk about it in the coherence lecture when we get to it. But basically, it's not easy in software. That's the takeaway over here. You could provide many mechanisms, and some of them have bugs. They may not work very well. For example, the ISA can provide a flush global instruction that basically flushes the cache containing address A, uh, or flushes the cache block. Uh, you could also flush the entire cache as well, but that's very heavy handed. But you could flush or invalidate the cache block containing address A from all other processors' caches, and the prog programmer somehow needs to use those instructions. Uh, of course, you need to have some guarantees in these instructions if you want to do this coherence in, a, in this way, in this fine-grained way. Another way of doing it is, of course, flushing the entire cache, right? Or flushing a page from the cache such that somebody else has access to the page and unlocking that page such that, such that someone else cannot use that page, right? So that, those are high overhead. So hardware, if you actually have hardware support, this simplifies the software's job, right? Clearly. Uh, 
One idea would be to invalidate all other copies of a cache block A when the processor writes to it. And this is done automatically. The programmer doesn't need to do anything. And this life is easier. This is a classic, another classic example of the programmer microarchitect trade-off. Here, the burden is on the programmer. Whatever instructions you provide, if you say, programmer, it's your responsibility to make sure that this processor doesn't load 1,000. And if you don't care about it, that's also your responsibility. That's one way of punting on the programmer. But that makes average programmer's life a lot harder. Uh, whereas if you actually support, provide the cache coherence support in hardware, average programmer's life is much easier. My favorite example uh, of uh, processors that do not provide cache coherence support is IBM Cell uh, broadband engine. It's actually the first heterogeneous multi-core processor uh, that was designed. It had one uh, control core and uh, eight uh, essentially a data parallel cores. They called it synergistic processing elements. And the control core was a primary processing element. But basically, they decided not to have uh, cache coherence. It was all programmer managed uh, coherence, uh, software based uh, cache management as well. Uh, and it was a nightmare to manage. It was a nightmare to write compilers for. Uh, it was used in Sony PlayStation 2, I think. And then it was not used anywhere else after that. Uh, so these things happen. People sometimes go back and try to say, OK, let, let's remove cache coherence because it's easier to design in hardware. Yes, you may make it work with a lot of pain, but then uh, it doesn't last for a really long time. So some uh, virtual memory is another example, actually. If the programmer needs to manage the data movement between the disk and uh, the memory, it's a lot of difficulty for the programmer. Hardware simplifies the software's job. So one example, Snoopy cache coherence is uh, uh, where caches snoop each other's write and read operations. Uh, we're going to talk about this more, but a simple protocol could be uh, observing the read and write operations of different processors. Um, and there are some actions, basically, you, the processor can read from a block, processor can write to a block. Whenever the processor writes to a block that's valid in its cache, it basically uh, broadcasts a bus write signal saying that I'm writing to block A, let's say. And whenever another processor receives a bus write signal, it basically turns its valid cache block to an invalid cache block. Right. Basically, this is a very simple Snoopy cache coherence protocol. You have two states for each cache block, valid versus invalid. You don't even have dirty, because we're assuming write through cache over here, as you can see. And you don't allocate on writes. Uh, that's the assumption. It's a very simple protocol, maybe not the best protocol, clearly not the best protocol, actually. Uh, but basically, the hardware says, whenever you see a bus write signal, invalidate the block. And uh, yeah, I think that's the key over here. Uh, and if you want to write to a block, uh, in this case, this is an interesting example. Let's assume that if you, you have a block, uh, you want to write to it, you basically uh, write to it, you do a write through, and you send a bus write signal such that anyone else who sees the bus write signal invalidates its block. OK? It's a very simple protocol. We may actually have a lab on cache coherence, which is always the fun lab, uh, but we'll see depending on how much time we have. It could be an optional lab, or it could be a real lab, but probably it's an optional lab. It's, it's, a, it's the most fun lab, though, having the cache coherence lab. <laughs> Once you do the cache coherence lab, you're ready for a job at any company. <laughs> OK. Uh, OK, so that's one example of caching issues, which we're going to cover later on, uh, hopefully. So let's take a look at some other examples. Well, one other issue is, uh, how, uh, how does the cache hierarchy change in a multi-core system? Uh, we're going to talk about private versus shared caching. Private cache, cache belongs to a single uh, core. Uh, a shared cache block, meaning that a shared cache block can mean multiple caches. Right? So you replicate, basically. Whereas if you have a shared cache, cache is shared by multiple cores, which means that a shared cache block is only in one place. So you actually fundamentally gain some efficiency with a shared cache uh, when you have a lot of sharing, data sharing that's happening across the course, right? And we discussed this, this is actually, uh, whenever you have physical resource sharing, it's also very much compatible with the shared memory model. That's, a, that's the example that I gave earlier, but now it's more pictorial over here. Right? Okay, so there are advantages between, uh, for shared caches and disadvantages. So the big advantage is, you get high effective capacity. We've already seen this, actually, when we talked about resource partitioning and uh, resource sharing. Uh, 
but now we are looking at the specific example of caches. You get high effective capacity, uh, meaning that if a core is not using the cache that's allocated to it over here, it could use very little here, and some other core that needs that cache can use that cache space that would be otherwise allocated to another core if you were not doing shared caches. That's obvious. Basically, it's dynamic partitioning of available cache space. You don't have uh, fragmentation due to static partitioning. It's easier to maintain coherence because a cache block is in a single location. Actually, there is no, no need for coherence in this L2 cache over here, right? Because all of the cores see that L2 cache. Uh, they all update the shared cache. In fact, that's one way of getting rid of the need for coherence, make all caches shared. But that's not easy for, that's not good for scalability in general. So also shared data and locks do not ping pong between caches. So if you actually look at uh, these caches over here, if this core wants to uh, access some uh, lock, it needs to bring it into the cache. And then this core wants to take the lock, it needs to bring it into the cache. If this core wants to take the lock, it needs to bring it into the cache. They, they all basically keep ping ponging the lock as well as shared data across the caches because they need to both read and write to it, uh, read from and write to it. Okay, so disadvantages, uh, whenever you have a shared resource, you get slower access. Basically because that resource is shared across many cores and so let me go back here. If you design it this way, it's slower access because now you need to have many ports to this cache. You need to have some sort of interconnect. We've also seen this actually when we talked about it, right? With this a multi-ported cache essentially, or even if it's a single ported cache, you need to have some interconnect to route these. Whereas if you look at this case over here, this cache can be customized to this core. You could actually make the interconnect much smaller over here. There's no need for an interconnect. Here you can bank the cache, of course, but banking the cache doesn't make it partitioned uh, because this core can access this other bank over here also, right? You could distribute this cache like we've discussed earlier, and that makes it more scalable, clearly, but that doesn't change the fact that it's slower access because some parts of the cache are slower access. Not all, uh, from the point of view of some cores, right? Okay. So we've already discussed this again. Cores incur conflict misses due to other cores accesses. You get uh, misses due to inter-core interference. And this is the interference and quality of service problem. So whenever you have sharing, uh, uh, you have a disadvantage. And again, uh, guaranteeing a minimum level of service to each core uh, is harder. How much space do you provide? How much bandwidth do you provide? Basically, you've already statically partitioned it over here, so you have performance isolation, whereas you don't have that isolation over here. Okay, so the, this, we've covered that. Uh, so uh, how, basically, if you, let's assume that we start with shared caches now. now. We're gonna ignore the private caching for a while. Uh, if you have time, we're gonna discuss uh, how to bridge the gap between those two. But let's start with shared caches. Then the key question is how to share. Uh, one option is basically do nothing, like dumb resources. Like, uh, we use the same policies we use in single core machines for multi-core also. It's called free-for-all sharing. Uh, you have the same replacement and replacement policies, let's say LRU or pseudo LRU or something more intelligent, MLP aware cache replacement, I don't know. Uh, but this is not thread or application aware, which means that an incoming block evicts a block uh, regardless of which threads the block uh, belongs to. Right. Uh, the, so this leads to inefficient utilization because LRU is not the best policy, especially when you have multi-core. A cache-unfriendly application can destroy the performance of a cache-friendly application if you do this. And not all applications benefit equally from the same amount of cache. Uh, free for all might prioritize those applications that do not benefit actually. We will see an example, multiple examples of this. So you get reduced performance and reduced fairness. So you don't want free for all, just like we don't want a memory controller that's uh, doing first ready, first come, first serve, right? That's not thread aware, and free for all is also not thread aware. So uh, there are two aspects that we're going to discuss as we talk. Basically, one is controlling the cache sharing. Uh, there are two approaches here. One is designing shared caches, but controlling the amount of cache allocated to different cores. You start with a shared cache, and you try to partition it slightly, dynamically maybe. The second approach is you start with a private cache, uh, and you try to share that private cache. So the cache is fundamentally private, but you spill data to some other core's caches. In the end, they look similar, of course, these approaches, but uh, we will see some differences. In the end, they meet somewhere in the middle. 
but we're going to look at both approaches over here. More efficient cash utilization, basically the goal here is to minimize the wasted cash space. That's always good if, uh, if you want to minimize the wasted cash space. How do you do that? You keep out the useless blocks. You don't even insert them into the cash. You keep in the blocks that have the maximum benefits for however you define the benefit, and we're going to define the benefit in some way soon. And you minimize the redundant data. Uh, actually, you can increase that to minimize the redundant tag somehow, right? There's a lot of zeros, for example, in the cache block. Get rid of them and code them in a better way. Right. Okay, so controlled caching. We're not going to cover all of these papers clearly, but uh, we're going to start with uh, something at the top over here. And some efficient cache utilization examples. We've already discussed MLP where cache replacement. I'm not going to go back to that, but we're, we'll probably cover some of these over here. So let's start with controlled cache sharing. And we're going to look at the idea of hardware-based cache partitioning first, and then we're going to move to software a little bit. Uh, these are not necessarily disparate from each other, but we're going to look at uh, the upsides and downsides. So I'm going to introduce you the idea of utility-based cache partitioning. Uh, this basically uh, tries to be intelligent about which uh, cache blocks to keep in the cache for maximizing system throughput. Uh, when you are running multiple applications. So go the goal is to maximize system throughput. It's not fairness or quality of service in this case. And the observation is very simple. Not all threads or applications benefit equally from caching. For a given cache block, that cache block is much better utilized by some applications compared to some other applications, which means that simple LRU replacement is not good for system throughput. And the idea is very simple here. It's, it can actually be ex uh, used for many other shared resources as well allocate more cache space to applications that obtain the most benefits from the additional cache space that you allocate to them. And the high level idea, as I said, can be applied to other shared resources. And this was introduced by uh, these two works actually. This provides a much more implementable uh, mechanism and a much more easier to read paper. So maybe at some point, if, you, if you'd like to read it, take a look at this one. Okay, so basically we're going to define the marginal utility of a cache way. We're gonna use some economic concepts. A uh, utility defined this way is the misses that you get with A ways minus the misses that you get with B ways. Basically, how much utility do you gain by adding one more way to, uh, to, to the particular application? Way is basically, essentially, you, you may have a cache that is 32 ways, right? And you part you're trying to partition the way. So there's going to be way partitioning. It's not going to be on a block basis. Uh, because way partitioning is a lot easier. If you have 32 ways, you basically ded dedicate this column to this application, and one way is gone for uh, one application, maybe five ways is gone for some other application, right? So if, by going from, uh, let, me, let me try to get this right, misses with A ways. Okay, by going from uh, A ways to B ways, this is uh, the utility that you get. So let's take a look at an example. This is an application that's relatively streaming. Uh, and this is the misses per thousand instructions that you experience in a one megabyte 16 way L2 cache uh, when you allocate from one to 16 ways to this application. Basically, this is one sixteenth of the cache is allocated to this application, and then two sixteenth, three sixteenth, four sixteenths, dot, dot, dot. As you can see, this application doesn't benefit much from the additional ways that you give, it, give to it. Because it could be streaming, right? It could be never reusing. Data, data blocks, or maybe it could have a small working set that you're using that, but everything else is not reusing. So it's low utility. Let's take a look at another application. This actually benefits a lot. As you keep giving a waste to this application, you, it, you get benefit. The miss rate keeps reducing. Right? That's high utility. And there's another application. Uh, this is called saturating utility. That's one example of a saturating utility. Basically, you keep giving waste to this application. At, after some point, miss rate becomes zero or saturates at some level over here. In this case, it gets very close to zero, as you can see. So our applications have clearly different characteristics. So uh, when you run, run, let's say, these two applications together, it makes no sense to allocate a lot of cash to this application, right? Low utility application. You gain a lot more benefit by using that cash space for the green one and some amount for the blue one. And that's the idea. So motivation is if you use LRU, LRU gives you some, uh, LRU of course doesn't do way partitioning, right? But it gives you some distribution of cache blocks somehow based on the access patterns. And you may end up somewhere like this. You basically end up dedicating one half of your cache 
almost one health, I guess seven, seven out of 16 ways to e-quake, earthquake simulation application, and uh, nine out of your 16 ways aggregated across blocks uh, to this VPR virtual place on route application, right? Uh, this is not optimal as you can see because you could have gotten away uh, with allocating much little, much less cash to this eQuake application. So that's LRU. If you do utility-based cash purchasing, you would like to be probably at this point. You want to allocate this many ways to eQuake and this many ways to uh, uh, VPR. And if you sum up the cash miss rates, uh, LRU's cash miss rate sum is much higher than a utility-based cash miss rate sum. So we would like to improve performance by giving more cash to the application that benefits from that more cash. So how do you do that is the next question, right? Actually, we've seen some of this in MLP aware cash replacement. Uh, we're going to use some of the concepts. Uh, so basically, there are three components. Uh, let's assume two cores in this case. So scalability of this will be an issue if you want to scale this to 1,000 cores. How do you scale that will be a problem as we will discuss later on. But let's assume a small number of cores. Uh, you want to monitor the utility that each core gets out of the shared cache, and you want to have a partitioning algorithm based on that utility, and you want to have cache replacement support to enforce the partitions that you allocate. Basically, partition alloc algorithm will give us how many ways you should allocate based on the utility monitors, and then you need to enforce that. So how do you do the utility monitors? Uh, basically, for each core, we simulate the LRU policy using a separate tag store called auxiliary tag directory or auxiliary tag store. Uh, you basically have hit counters in the auxiliary tag directory. These count hits per recency position. And because LRU is a stack algorithm, hit counts in a given way gives you the utility. So basically, uh, if you have 16 ways, if you want to figure out what would be the number of hits that you would get if you had only two ways, you basically sum up the hit counts that you receive in way zero and way one most recently used and the next most recently used ways. That's the idea over here. I'm going to give you an example in a little bit. Basically, you have this main tag store. You have, for each application, an auxiliary tag store. But if you remember from uh, MLP or cache replacement, you could reduce the size of this by sampling. OK, so basically, you have hit counters for all positions, MRU through LRU, 16 ways. And you keep counting how many hits each application gets in each way. And if you want to figure out how many hits this application would have gotten, if only one way is allocated to it, you just look at hit counter zero. If you want to figure out how many hits this application would have gotten, if you allocated three ways to this application, you just sum up the three counters over here. And this one gives an example of that. Basically, uh, for each recency position, MRU through LRU, you have a hit counter in the auxiliary tag directory, tag store. And let's assume you have this. Yeah, the hit counter values that look like this, and you also count the misses in the system. And you can draw this curve, basically. Once you have these numbers in a separate tax store that's not interfered by some other applications, that's really important, now you can draw these curves. This is basically the curve. This is, if I give this number of ways per set for, for this application, this is the number of misses I, I would get. If I give four ways, I get 25 misses. If I give three ways, I get 25 plus 10. If I give two ways, I get 25 plus 10 plus 15. Dot, dot, dot. Right. That's the idea. And this works nicely because MRU, uh, uh, because this is a recency-based algorithm, right, LRU. OK, so once you have this curve, you can basically do what I just discussed, right? You can try to find the right points in the curve uh, if you have, multiple, uh, you have these curve for multiple applications. OK, so how do you actually do this? So this, uh, you can say, OK, your cache is huge, uh, and you don't want an auxiliary tag directory for all of your applications. And they, they incur a lot of overhead. So basically, we're going to use the idea of dynamic set sampling from the MLP or cache replacement work. Uh, basically, we're not going to use, uh, uh, have, have an entry for each set in this auxiliary tag directory, but we're going to do sampling. So the main tag directory, some uh, sets will be sampled. And you're going to use uh, only those sets to count the hits to these different recency positions. And you would assume that those sets are sampled nicely such that your overall, your cache behaves similarly. And you can actually see that you can select some number of sets. Unless your distribution is extremely skewed across the sets, you can select uh, a small number of sets. And actually, uh, 
since we've discussed randomization in caches in the past, if you actually do good randomization of your index into the caches, your distribution should not be skewed that much. So, okay. so basically you pick 32 sets as opposed to, I don't know, 16,000 sets. Okay, now let's, uh, the next step is the partitioning algorithm. Now we know how uh, uh, for a given number of ways, how many hits uh, that we're going to get for a given application or how many misses that we're going to get for an application. The partitioning algorithm can evaluate all possible partitionings across different applications and select the best. Now this quickly doesn't scale very well, but uh, I'll give you the example. So for example, if you have only two cores, you uh, look at the hits uh, that you get with when you give A ways to core one and 16 minus A ways to core two. And you can get that from these utility monitors based on the curves that you actually showed. And you compute this for all values of A. Okay, you can do that maybe with two cores and uh, let's say 16 way caches. And you select an A that maximizes the sum of the hit counts. Right. So that's one algorithm. And you do this every n million cycles. Okay, that's the idea basically. It's not a good algorithm uh, to scale up, of course. Um, so how do you enforce the partitions? Uh, once, you, once you've decided uh, you give A ways to core one and 16 minus A ways to core two, uh, you need to somehow support the way partitioning. Each line, each cache block has core ID bits on a miss you count the ways occupied in the set by the ap application that's causing the miss. And if the ways occupied is less than the ways given, meaning ways allocated to that application based on the partitioning algorithm, then this application can use more ways in this particular set. So you select a victim from the other application and you know which application is occupying. You, you know the lines that are occupied by the other application and you select the LRU of that. So this complicates the way uh, uh, management a little bit, but you can do it. If you, if you occupied more ways or equal ways to what you were given, then you basically select the victim cache block from the application that's trying to insert the block into the cache itself. Right. So that's hopefully uh, obvious. Basically, uh, you try to uh, obey, uh, you try to uh, use as many ways as you're given. But this also adapts to the access patterns across sets, so this is done on a set basis, uh, not on a real way partitioning base, uh, basis. So this requires some counters and additional metadata in the set. Okay, so there are some performance metrics. We didn't cover performance metrics a lot, but you're reading a lot of papers with performance metrics. And this paper evaluates multiple different performance metrics over here. Weighted speed up is essentially a competitive ratio. And this paper looks at two cores. Uh, this is a default metric. We've discussed this before, basically. That's your shared IPC, that's your IPC alone, and uh, that's the speed up that you get when you actually share uh, the, the system with another uh, application, and you sum up the speed ups. It's weighted because the baseline weight is your baseline IPC, as you can see. And this was shown to correlate with system throughput by some other works. You can also look at IPC, instruction per cycle throughput, not system throughput, basically sum up the IPC. This is really not that great because it can be unfair to low IPC applications. So you can actually game all of these metrics. Uh, whenever you want to maximize some metric, you can also always game them. So this one, for example, if you want to maximize, if you define performance this way, and if you want to maximize uh, instructions per cycle, you would like to always prioritize low IPC applications, right? Or high IPC applications, right? Now there's some truth to it, but this metric actually reduces the probability of gaming a little bit. And this is also harmonic mean fairness. It basically tries to balance fairness and performance as opposed to having an arithmetic mean, uh, arithmetic speed up like this. It basically uh, takes the harmonic mean of those speed ups. And you can read the papers for more details. You've seen these metrics in some of the papers that you read. Okay, so these are the results that you would get if you do utility-based cache partitioning. So if you do uh, for various workloads over here, and this is geometric mean, and this is weighted speed up uh, with two cores. So LRU is the red part. Uh, if you do partitioning, meaning private caches, let's say, half and half, that's the blue part. So if you overall, using LRU, shared caches, and uh, partition caches is essentially very similar to each other, average across these workloads on these two core systems. But if you do utility-based cache partitioning, you gain a lot. Right? So that's the idea. That's the, that's the benefit that you get with this idea.
And there's also more IPC results for different benchmarks, and you can take a look at it. So the instructions per cycle, how these different benchmarks get affected. It's not always fair, basically, because some benchmarks lose performance, some benchmarks gain performance, but overall performance increases. And you can read the paper for more detail. Okay, do you see any problems with this mechanism? I think I've already given you the partitioning algorithm, right? Yeah, exactly. There are more than two cores, right? What if you have 16 cores? Yeah, okay. Basically, scalable to many cores, right? How do you scale this to many cores? Um, there are multiple issues here. Uh, one is, do you have enough ways to partition? Maybe you don't. That's a downside. So your cache needs to have enough ways greater than the number of cores. Uh, but maybe it's, a, it's not a good design to have uh, too few ways. And so you could argue that. But there's another issue, which is the time complexity of partitioning uh, uh, when you increase the number of cores. Actually, the time complexity of partitioning for two cores is low. Because it's, it's not that. You basically evaluate for all A's that, do, uh, that I, what I just discussed. And number of possible partitions is equal to number of ways, approximately. Possible partitions increase exponentially with cores. And uh, this is calculated in the paper for a 32-way cache. Number of possible partitions is for four cores is 6,500. For eight cores is 15.4 million. Clearly, you're not going to be able to evaluate 15.4 million possible partitions, right? That's not a good algorithm. So that partitioning algorithm that we just discussed is a bad algorithm. And actually, it's not. It's an NPR problem, so you need a scalable partitioning algorithm. So there's actually some past work in this area. Uh, Harold Stone, who's who is the person who wrote the first paper, actually, on processing in memory in general purpose systems in, the, in 1970. He basically, the, that paper was titled The Logic in Memory Computer. He also did some work while he was at IBM on optimal partitioning of cache memory. He looked at the main memory system, and he was, he was basically trying to give enough pages to uh, different applications such that uh, you would minimize the miss rate. So it's a very similar problem to what we have at hand. And he proposed an algorithm that tries to minimize overall number of misses. And it's a greedy algorithm. Basically, uh, the idea is to look at one block. It allocate, you allocate one block to the application that has the maximum utility for that particular block. And you allocate that block. And then you basically say, I have another block. Let me find the application that has the maximum utility for that particular block. And then you allocate that block to that application. And then you keep doing this basically greedily. Repeat until all blocks are allocated. OK, I mean, you can read the paper for more detail. This provides very good partitioning. I know utility curves are complex. Uh, convex, sorry. Uh, but basically, let's take a look at an example. Uh, if you have a look ahead of this, I'll call this one block as a look ahead. Uh, so for these curves, it's basically good, actually. But let's take a look at these curves over here. Uh, let's call it the greedy algorithm. A greedy algorithm considers benefit only from the immediate next block. It fails to exploit large gains from looking ahead. So the big problem with this greedy algorithm is it doesn't look ahead. As a result, it cannot anticipate this jump over here. If an application, for example, uh, for, if you look at this application for block B, if you give one more block, you can think of block as way also. One more way, oh, it doesn't benefit that much. If you give two more blocks, it doesn't benefit that much. If you give three more blocks, it benefits a lot. But if you're looking only one block ahead, you will never see three blocks ahead. As a result, you will keep allocating blocks to application A because the next block always provides benefit for application A. Right? That's the downside of not having enough look ahead in the algorithm. So basically, if you go through the algorithm iterations, in each iteration, the utility for one block for application A is 10 because you eliminate 10 misses if you allocate one more block to A. And for application B is zero. And the greedy algorithm keeps allocating one more block to application A because it doesn't have enough look ahead to see this huge jump in B. So all blocks are assigned to A even if B has the same miss reduction with even fewer blocks. So this is very inefficient, as you can see. So the idea is to have a look ahead. You, have, you, you basically define the margin utility per cache resource and have some look ahead for all possible allocations. Don't just look at one block, look at all possible number of blocks that you could allocate to an application. And if you do it in the number of ways, number of ways is much smaller than the number of blocks, so it's actually not so hard to do. So consider all possible allocations. Select the application that has the max value for the marginal utility, 
and allocate as many blocks that are required to get that maximum marginal utility. And repeat until all blocks are assigned. Let's take an example over here. So basically, in iteration one, the maximum marginal utility that you get from application A is 10. If you allocated one more block, you'll get 10. If you allocated two more blocks, you'll get 20. So you will choose to allocate one more block to get 10, right? Because it's the same marginal utility. Marginal utility is always 10, even if you allocate eight blocks to it. But if you look at B, you consider allocating one block, two blocks, three blocks, four blocks, five blocks, six blocks, seven blocks, eight blocks. And you will find that the maximum marginal utility is 80 when you allocate three blocks. And 80 out of, divided by three is greater than 10 out of one, 10 divided by one. As a result, in the first iteration, B gets three blocks. And the next iteration, next five iterations, B doesn't have, uh, B's marginal utility is essentially zero because its miss rate doesn't reduce anymore, whatever number of blocks it gets, whereas you keep basically iterating and giving A the remaining five blocks. So as a result, A gets five blocks and B gets three blocks, and this is the optimal solution uh, in this case. Okay, so let's look at it. Of course, this is more complicated, and you can read the paper to figure out the detail, the time complexity is. The good thing is it's not dependent on the number of blocks, it's dependent on the number of ways uh, uh, in this case. Okay. Okay, so what's the benefit if you actually use this algorithm? So uh, evaluate all is what we said. Uh, basically, you evaluate all possible partitions. And in this case, I think these are four core workloads uh, with 32 ways. Uh, LRU is the red one. Actually, greedy algorithm sometimes loses performance, as you can see. It makes suboptimal decisions, especially in the, if, the com if the curves are not uh, nice. Uh, you actually allocate blocks to the applications that do not necessarily benefit because you're not looking ahead far enough. Evaluate all, of course, should get the best performance because you're actually evaluating every possible partitioning. But of course, it's not realistic to implement. Look ahead is hopefully, in the best case, it should get close to evaluate all. And it gets close to evaluate all as you can see over here. Okay, with low time complexity, of course. Right? Okay, so let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages. I think I've already told a lot of this, but let's uh, put them together. So this improves system throughput clearly, obviously, uh, as with the results that are shown. It better utilizes the shared cache when it's shared between multiple applications. So there are some disadvantages and limitations. Uh, so fairness is an issue. Quality of service is an issue. These are issues that are not tackled by this idea, right? This idea, the goal was to improve system throughput. This is like Atlas uh, memory scheduler. The goal was not to tackle fairness or quality of service. The key question is, can you somehow incorporate fairness or quality of service into an algorithm like this? It's not clear. It's not easy, I think. And also scalability. Uh, partitioning is limited to ways. What if you have a number of ways less than number of applications? That's a problem. Uh, and how is utility computed in a distributed cache? So if you want to really scale the cache to many cores, how do you compute the utility? So other works have tackled this problem, but I'm not going to go into this. Uh, it becomes not so easy uh, to do. And also, what if past behavior is not a good predictor of utility? Because you're partitioning the cache on an interval basis. In the next interval, you're using these partitions. How do you actually do that? Uh, uh, like if, it, if, if an application changes behavior significantly, this doesn't work very well. But this is true for all interval-based mechanisms. That's a common limitation. And this idea is applicable to many other potential resources. As we just discussed, Harold Stone applied it to main memory and pages in main memory, right? Uh, okay, any questions, comments? So this was one of the really interesting works that appeared early on in multi-core and it's influenced a lot of other works. There's a lot more work, there are a lot more works on cache partitioning, some of which build on this, some of which don't build on this. You can find probably a thousand papers on the topic, but I've selected only a few. Your question? Okay. <laughs> okay, so let's move on. Let's try to now, uh, as opposed to improving throughput, let's try to be fair. I'm going to give you some other ideas. Uh, it's actually even earlier work. Uh, the idea is to actually equalize the slowdowns of multiple threads sharing the cache. And the idea that I'm going to describe is to dynamically estimate the slowdowns due to sharing and assign cache blocks to balance the slowdowns. And you approximate the slowdown with change in miss rate. So the slowdown estimation here is very, very coarse. 
it's not trying to really estimate the slowdown, but using, it uses the miss rate as a proxy. But miss rate is actually usually not a good proxy because it, does, it ignores uh, a lot of issues like memory level parallelism and also how much miss rate impacts performance. So take this with a grain of salt. This is old. The new ideas, as we've discussed, request service rate is a much better proxy actually for uh, slowdowns. Uh, and OK, we're going to cover that. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, let's take a look at uh, how this works. I'm going to give you pictorially how this works. So let's assume that it's an interval-based mechanism. You basically, in the first interval, uh, you t so this paper assumes that you are given the miss rate alone. Somebody gives you the miss rate alone. Uh, P1's miss rate alone is 20%. P2's miss rate is 5%. Of course, it's not very realistic. It's very profile-based. So you really want to figure out the miss rate alone as well. Uh, so miss rate shared, you compute that uh, over time in this interval, and you get this, for example. And you basically evaluate the slowdown compared to miss rate alone. You see that P2's slowdown is much higher if you are computed based on miss rates. This is one. P1 didn't slow down. P2 slowed down by 3x in terms of the miss rate, which means that you need to allocate, basically, the suggestion is that you need to allocate more cash to P2. And basically, you repartition the cash in this case. So as a, you start with that equal partition. And then how do you repartition? Let's assume that you have a partitioning granularity of 64 kilobytes. You allocate 64 kilobytes to uh, P2. And now P2 gets more cash, P P1 gets less cash, and you need to enforce it somehow. This paper enforced it using block counts. It tries to get as close to possible of a distribution as the allocation over here. And you partition it. Uh, in the next interval, you evaluate miss rate shared again. And you figure out this goes down to 10%. Now, uh, P1 is still 20%. That's good. P2 is uh, slowed down by 2x, whereas P1 has not slowed down. It seems like P1 is not benefiting a lot from the cache, right? So you do another partitioning. You give 64 uh, kilobytes more to P2. And then, basically, uh, you evaluate in the next interval again. In this case, your miss rate can look like this. P1 may increase to 25% and P2 may go down to 9%. And if you look at the slowdowns, uh, this is 25 divided by 20 and this is 9 divided by 5 and 25 divided by 20 is less than 9 divided by 5. So now you're treating P1 unfairly. So do something else basically. So I'm not going to go into the details but the paper has some mechanism to roll back the decisions. So it's, uh, it's basically operating this way computing how much miss rate that you have compared to when you run alone. Alone estimates are statically provided. It's not determined dynamically, and that's one potential downside of the mechanism. Uh, and basically try to achieve balanced uh, miss rate increases across different applications. You could argue maybe this is a good metric or a bad metric. It's not really slow down. So that's going to be one of the downsides of the mechanism. OK, and then you basically roll back your partitions. So, I've given you the concepts. Uh, clearly, something like this reduces starvation. Uh, so that's good. You get better average throughput on average. That's also good. And you actually have block granularity partitioning in this case. Uh, I'm going through this relatively quickly, but you can read the paper for more details. So if you have a mechanism like this, actually, uh, this, uh, uh, it turns out uh, this alone miss rate estimation, which is assumed to be static in this work, may be very incorrect uh, because you're not, it's, it's average across the workload. How do you determine a single number for a given workload when the workload is changing behavior? There's a lot of phase changes actually in the behavior, uh, phase changes in the behavior of the workload, yeah, cache miss rate behavior. As a result, this actually is usually incorrect. Uh, so for the uh, fairness we have source throttling work actually, we tried something similar uh, using, uh, okay, this is your baseline IPC uh, uh, and uh, you, use, you determine it via profiling run by running the application alone. And if you use just that as opposed to determining your uh, IPC while you're running together with others, uh, you're determining your alone IPC on an interval basis, uh, usually you get very inaccurate slowdown estimates. Okay, so is this scalable to many cores? This has a very similar problem like we discussed uh, for... Um, utility-based cache partitioning, if you go back to the algorithm, basically you need to 
increase and decrease the partitions. And that doesn't become, uh, that's not very easy. And this doesn't do it in a more, uh, so if you think about utility-based cache partitioning, it's a, it's a relatively principled approach, right? The approach is principled in the sense that you define a marginal utility function, and you basically try to enforce, try to maximize that marginal utility. Here, it's very much heuristic-based. Uh, uh, in a sense, it's similar to fairness via source throttling. You increase your partition and decrease your partition and try some partitions, and then hopefully you'll get to a good space. Right? You try out space. So it's less principled from that perspective. It's, it resembles more like fairness via source throttling, where you need to figure out, OK, by how much should you increase? Right? That's not easy. In general, this is another example of uh, uh, a mechanism that requires a lot of thresholds to optimize. So maybe I should put that over there. So there are a lot of thresholds to optimize. Is this the best or a good fairness metric? Miss rate shared divided by miss rate alone. Actually, it's not a very good estimate or slowdown, so maybe it's not. And does this provide performance isolation in the cache? Of course not, because it's not trying to do that, right? That's not the goal over here. Okay, so I've given you two examples of hardware-based cache partitioning mechanisms. Any questions? With two different goals. Are they interesting? Somewhat? Yeah? <laughs> For some people, maybe. OK, maybe we'll do one more, which is software-based cache partitioning, and we'll be done. Uh, let's take a look at this. It's actually really interesting. Um, so memory channel partitioning is actually software-based uh, partitioning. right? You're basically partitioning memory channels across different, uh, 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 across different uh, applications. You could partition the banks uh, as well, and other people have done that. You could also partition the cache using software. Uh, and it, actually, memory channel partitioning uses uh, an approach called page coloring. Because you know uh, whenever you allocate a physical page, you know the color of the page. Color is the color that belongs to the memory controller. Right? This, these physical pages are red because they are from the red memory controller. These physical pages are blue because they are from the blue memory controller. And you can actually do the virtual to physical mapping such that an application gets red pages, and another application gets blue pages. Right. We're going to use the same concept. Because the virtual to physical page mapping affects which indices, which sets an address goes to. And that's exactly how we're going to partition the cache. Some bits in the virtual address determine which, sets that, uh, which set the, uh, the address goes to. And if you actually say some of these uh, sets are red and some of these other sets are blue, you basically say red application gets uh, the sets that are red and the blue application gets the sets that are blue. That's the idea. We're assuming no hardware support. Uh, you have uh, demand-based cache sharing and a larger replacement. How can the OS best utilize the cache? So this is not the only way, actually. You could do cache sharing where thread scheduling, schedule the workloads that play nicely together in the cache. So that's why we covered the fundamental techniques, right? Thread scheduling is still possible to do in a shared cache to minimize interference. It's very fundamental. So basically, you try to put the applications whose working sets together fit in the cache and schedule them together. Uh, of course, this requires static dynamic profiling of application behavior. And this is one early paper that talks about that. But we're going to look at this one, cache sharing aware page coloring. You dynamically monitor the miss rate over an interval and change virtual to physical mapping to minimize the miss rate in a cache by trying out different partitions. So uh, there are multiple papers that discuss this. Uh, you could, uh, with the, if you do software-based cache partitioning, you could partition the cache statically, or you could partition the cache dynamically. Then the key, key question is still, how much cache do you allocate? Uh, for example, static cache partitioning predetermines the number of cache blocks allocated to each program at the beginning of the execution of the program, and it divides the shared cache to multiple regions and partitions the shared regions through OS page adder, uh, address mapping. And dynamic cache basically does this dynamically. It just adjusts cache quota among the processes dynamically by doing recoloring. And we'll see that this is a costly process. Uh, and it dynamically changes the cache usage of the process through uh, OS page address remapping. So this is what I said in words uh, put into pictures, basically. If you look at physical memory, it's divided into colors. And color is actually mapped to different cache sets because of the address bits that are used. Uh, uh, 
you basically, uh, some of the bits in your virtual address determine which set uh, this particular page maps to. As a result, it's over here in your cache, right? Actually, virtual to physical, uh, so your, your physical address, sorry. Some of the bits in your physical address determine uh, which set uh, that physical page address maps to. And you can actually map a physical page. Uh, this physical page over here maps to uh, this set, these sets. This physical page maps to these sets, and you can see the color over here. When the OS wants to partition the cache between two applications, it can allocate different colors to the different applications. Basically, it can say uh, two threads are allocated pages of different colors. If you want to make sure that uh, a process thread A doesn't interfere with thread B, you allocate these two colors to thread A and these two colors to thread B. That ensures that the cache is completely partitioned. One of the downsides, of course, memory is also partitioned right now. So you may actually get less memory. Uh, so there are actually issues with cache partitioning. You may not want memory to be partitioned, but you have to have memory partitioned this way. Okay, so basically this works because OS controls the address translation. It can map, it maps a virtual page number to a physical page number. And physical address is really the cache address over here. And some bits over here come from the physical page number. And these are the page color bits, basically. These bits don't matter because you cannot change them. But you can change, you can control these bits through the virtual to physical page mapping. As a result, you can, uh, I think we've already said this over here, all cache lines in a physical page are cached in one of those regions, one of the colors. And OS can control the page color of a virtual page through address mapping. And it selects a physical page with a specific value in this page color, mits, uh, page color bits, basically. So let's take a look at how you do the static cache partitioning using page color. And you group the physical pages into page bins according to their color. And essentially, a uh, physical index cache is now partitioned into different colors. And you basically allocate different colors to different processes to minimize the interference. So physical pages, uh, we already said this basically. You, you partition the cache, but as you see, the cost is main memory space is also partitioned to be able to do that because these are coupled together to each other. Now, this, that's why this may or may not be always good, right? You want to eliminate the interference in your cache. You're actually partitioning your memory, main memory as well. That may not be good in this case. You're limiting the number of uh, pages that you can allocate uh, from main memory. So it's better to do this not as a hard partitioning, but it's better to do it as soft partitioning. These are the preferred colors for an application. If application needs more pages, you don't give it more page faults, but you give it pages from different colors, potentially. So page management algorithms need to be influenced by this also if you want to get high performance. Okay, so hopefully this is clear, right? Basically, somehow you need to determine how many colors do you allocate to this particular application. I haven't even talked about that yet. This is basically showing that, assuming that you allocated these colors, whenever you want to allocate a page on a page fold, you give a physical page from uh, this set of colors to a given application. But somebody needs to determine how many uh, colors to allocate also. We'll talk about that. But before we talk about that, let's take a look at a uh, dynamic approach. This is static. Now we statically partitioned. If you change nothing, your cache is partitioned, your memory is partitioned, maybe it's good. But let's take a look at uh, what happens if you want to change the number of uh, sets that are allocated for a particular process. So you have these allocated colors. Uh, red, green, uh, yellow, 0, 1, 2, to a particular process. Uh, and basically, you, this is how you can organize it. It's one way of organizing it. You uh, organize uh, the pages of a process into linked lists by their colors, and memory allocation guarantees that pages are evenly distributed into all the lists, like this, basically. Whenever you're allocating, you're trying to do this. You're trying to balance the usage of the different colors. That way you could actually balancing the usage of different sets in your cache. Okay, now what happens if you want to allocate one more color to this particular application because let's say somehow you want to have more cache. It's not easy right now, right? Because these pages are allocated in some physical memory locations and you're using them. How do you actually move them to the blue color? One option is to say, okay, I'm going to allocate one more color but I'll wait until the application starts allocating new pages, getting page faults. You wait for a while. 
Maybe that never happens because the application has allocated all of its pages during its execution. So this paper actually looks at dynamic uh, page recoloring. And basically the idea is select some pages that were given some other colors and migrate them. So allocate a new color, meaning a new physical uh, location, and copy the memory contents to that physical memory location and free the old page. So this is one way of doing it. Of course, this has overhead if you want to recolor. Basically, to partition your cache in a different way, you're moving a lot of pages now. Is this a good choice? It may not be a good choice, right? Because you're causing a lot of data movement, which actually destroys your cache also, by the way, <laughs> uh, to actually partition your cache in a different way. So that's the downside of the software-based approaches usually. If you want to change the partition size dynamically, you have a problem. Uh, because you don't have fine-grained control on the hardware, you need to change the virtual to physical page mapping. That causes other problems also, right? You, you need to change the TLB mapping, so you need to flush the TLB as well. I didn't even talk about that over here. Uh, flush the TLB from that particular uh, page number. Uh, so there's a lot of overhead to change uh, the partition size. So this is one algorithm that's proposed by this paper. I'm not going to go through this in detail, uh, but this is a heuristic-based algorithm. Uh, it basically partitions the cache initially equally, and then it, uh, it runs the partition for some time, and it also runs the adjacent partitions and tries to, uh, it's basically hill climbing based method. Uh, it, it basically uh, ch checks what you would get if you gave one more way uh, to this application, one more set uh, to this application, or one more color in this case, one more color to this application and one less color to this application, and vice versa. And it compares the performance of each of those and basically chooses the next partitioning policy with the best measurement. It may not be the best way. Hill climbing approaches usually lose the, uh, they may be stuck in a local minima, right, or local maxima, depending on whether you're trying to minimize or maximize something. If you're minimizing cache miss rate, you basically need to have a nice curve uh, to be able to get to the best point. But this is one way of determining the partition. But you could employ some of the other uh, ideas that we've discussed. But of course, that requires a lot of work. So this actually has overhead also. right? How do you actually figure out which, what, what partitions do you use? These folks evaluated uh, this on a real system at the time. Uh, uh, I'm not, uh, basically, there are 16 colors in the system. You can see that that's 8 gigabytes. Uh, and they use performance monitoring counters to determine all of these metrics. So it's a very heavyweight approach. But it turns out they got a lot of benefit. Uh, they basically uh, tried to minimize the combined miss rate across these two core applications. And they got some benefit with static partitioning. They got some benefit with dynamic partitioning. But it turns out static partitioning actually worked better overall compared to dynamic partitioning because of the overhead of the dynamic partitioning mechanism that they had. So static partitioning, of course, is not very robust as you can see. And you can read the paper for more detail over here. I'm not gonna go through those. Okay, so we've seen another approach. Uh, this is now software-based cache partitioning without any hardware support, right? You could do it. It's heavy-handed, uh, but there's no need to change the hardware. That's the good part. Uh, and it's potentially easier to upgrade and change the algorithm because the algorithm is not burned into hardware, but you have limited uh, flexibility. Uh, Okay, disadvantages, you have very large granularity of partitioning. You basically do it on a page-based versus way-based or block-based. Uh, and you have limited page colors as well. So if you have actually, uh, you can actually get reduced performance per application because you have limited physical memory space. If you have only 16 colors, your physical memory is partitioned into 16 different colors. If you allocate one color to an application, if you do hard partitioning, you're using only 1 16th of your physical memory space for that application, right? Because you're partitioning your memory space as well. And that's usually one of the big downsides of these approaches. Uh, and you get reduced flexibility because of limited page colors, right? You cannot partition at a much finer grain. Okay, and as we've discussed, changing the partition size has very high overhead because you need to change the page mapping. Uh, and as a result, the dynamic partitioning is not performing as well as static partitioning in most cases uh, in, the, in the results of that work also. And also adaptivity is slow. Uh, hardware can potentially adapt every cycle, right? Every cycle you access the cache, you can kick out something. You can try to change the partition across different workloads. Whereas here, you cannot adapt every cycle. 
You cannot even adapt at very large intervals because of the huge page migration overheads. Right? And this is usually fundamental to hardware versus software. Right? Hardware can adapt every cycle. It can schedule another thread every cycle if you have multi-threading. Clearly, software cannot do that, right? Because there is a lot of overhead to, for communication with the hardware, moving the pages, scheduling the thread, setting up the context. There's a lot to do. Uh, so it's, it's, not fun, it's not very specific to uh, this particular cache management mechanism. It's general hardware versus, versus software trade-off. OK, and also, finally, uh, maybe not enough information may be exposed to software. So basically, you're at the mercy of your performance counters here. You need to profile your application, look at the performance counters, and usually performance counters are not a lot. And based on that, you need to make a decision. How much partition, how many colors should I give to this particular process versus some other process? And again, you may not have enough information. Right? OK. I think I've gone through a lot of ideas very quickly. <laughs> the ideas per second is very high here. <laughs> Hopefully, I didn't burn you out. But this is the end that I have for today. <laughs> Any questions? I still have some slack to run to the uh, train station. So if you have questions, I can take it. <laughs> Nothing burning. You can actually try these software-based partitioning mechanisms if you want on real systems. I'm actually curious if uh, people, people can get really good results with these in current systems. I haven't seen many uh, recent results. <laughs> That paper is, uh, actually has very good results. It's good to look at that paper. It's from HPCA 2008, from 10 years ago. But current systems, it's not clear uh, if you can get uh, very good results. It depends on your applications, of course. In general, if you know your applications really well, you can partition your cache really well also. OK. Questions? Doesn't sound like there are many. <laughs> okay, I guess let's uh, yeah, let's finish it right now. Have a good weekend, and we'll continue next week probably with this, but we'll probably move to a heterogeneous multi-core also. Let's see. Okay, see you. See you next week.